Okay, so that leads us into uh, some things I want to talk about. I am going to talk about evaluation measures for a bit today. So it is going to be like a little bit of a hodgepodge class. Okay, I am going to talk about a few things which do not really fit into a bigger theme. Right? So for as far as evaluation is concerned, we have spoken about some very standard things so far. Right? So in classification we talk about Come on, since give me something. Yeah, what what would be the evaluation measure in classification? Misclassification. Misclassification huh? error then? Cross entropy. Cross entropy. Huh? Cross entropy. Cross entropy then? Gini index. Okay. Um, Gini index is not an evaluation measure. Right? Gini index is more of a parameter selection mechanism. Right? Right. I can, I can after I finish the classification I can I can actually compute some kind of a deviance right and I can say okay is this method giving me a better deviance than that method and things like that or same thing for 0 1 error I can use squared error right uh, squared error of your uh, thing to a target variable uh, and anything else can I use penalties. Huh? Penalties. penalties in what sense uh, in the SVM uh -huh. Okay, so there are a couple of things that we have to be careful about here. So there is something which I optimize, right, to get to what I want, right, and there is something which I use for evaluating what I finally get. Right? If we limit ourselves to the classify the supervised learning scenario, right, we have not even started on supervised learning. We limit ourselves to supervised learning scenario. More often than not, what we really want to evaluate ourselves with is the performance on the entire data distribution right so i have some distribution of data right i don't know the distribution a priori i remember go back to the very first class we started talking about something serious i mean not the one with the pictures uh, right the one with the, uh, the the greek in it right uh, so in that class uh, we talked about there being an underlying data distribution right and that we did not know about this data distribution the only way we know anything about this data distribution is through training data points right is through the samples that are given to us right. So there is an underlying right. So we, we had this distribution so what I am really interested in is finding out when you give me a classifier how well it is performing with respect to this distribution right. So in that sense how well it is performing I am not really interested in figuring out the uh, the square the, the ridge regression loss or anything like that right. So I am using that to come up with a single classifier but at the end of the day when I am looking at how well this classifier is performing with respect to the underlying distribution I have certain measures. So one of them is the 0 1 loss right. So I do not care how we are right with the classifier right I just want to look at the 0 1 loss and then I can do that right that, that 0 1 loss gives me the misclassification error right. So ideally that is the evaluation measure that you should be using okay. So sometimes what people do because they are optimizing a different objective function they choose slightly different evaluation measures that make can make their method look better right. So squared error could be one evaluation measure if you are doing classification 0 1 loss is the, the measure that you should be looking at if you are doing regression a little tricky but squared error is the most widely accepted uh, measure for looking at regression but then you can look at other things also like deviance and other things you can use that for classification right. But having said that how do I estimate? It is easier for me to write classifier or, or I will pick one I am going to pick classifier but some of what I talk about now it works for regression as well right.
And how do I estimate the true performance of the classifier? So, what do I mean by that? I have given you a sample data, right? I have given you some sample drawn from P x y, right? So, based on the training that I that is all the information I have, right? And I can use some some of the data for training. I, I actually find the parameters. Now, how do I find out how good these parameters are or how good is my there are two, two questions to ask right. So, the first question is how good are my parameters that I have found ok. The second question to ask is how good is the method that I use for finding the parameters is. If you give me a slightly different data will I perform better or worse right. How will I perform right. So, I need to know something about the technique right. Suppose I am proposing a new technique right and I want you to go use it on your data later on right. But I should convince you that you can use it on whatever data you have right. So, that means I will have to convince you that my technique is good for finding the parameters this is the two things here for a given set of parameters I have to figure out how good they are right and I also need to tell you how good my overall mechanism for finding these parameters are right. So, for a given set of parameters how do you find out how good they are? Hmm? On the training data, is that good enough? Testing. On the testing data, cross validated. <laughs> okay, so people are get, so we will get 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 to this thing, right? So one thing which we spoke about earlier was to split the data into into train and test, right? So, if I estimate parameters on the training data okay, and run it on the test data that will give you some performance ok. Is that a good estimate of the true performance of the classifier? Why not? So, the test data might not be independent of the training data ok, the training data may be biased. I might have over uh, the model then you are doomed <laughs> right so no see, that's that's actually a very very valid point in fact uh, 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 that's something which you will face in real life right but uh, the assumption mostly we make in, uh, in in theory is that the training data that is given to you is a sufficiently representative data of the true distribution ok. If that is not the case then you are doomed anyway right. So, you assume that it is the uh, so in real life that happens what do you do? In real life that happens ok I mean you cannot avoid it you cannot just say ok I am assuming it is a properly uh, representative sample of the underlying distribution then what do you do in that case? Stratified uh, some. Ah. Come on, he is telling that you are not sample the entire uh, range of Pxy. So, what is exactly? So, figure out where you are deficient, right? So, sometimes the most obvious thing is what you have to do, you have to sample more, right? But then do not blindly sample. I mean, of course, if you blindly sample, you may actually return the same samples from uh, whatever uh, region you already have, right? So, what you should do is you should be more careful in how you do the sampling. So, you can use this is where you try to understand what the data is all about right. So, you try to understand how the data is distributed the data that is given to you is distributed and figure out if there are parts of the input space which you believe are important but are not covered in the data right. Go and try to sample from that region right. So, there are uh, different names for this ok. So, one popular thing that people call this by is called called active learning because I actively I am asking you for samples ok. So, I am not passively learning from the samples that were given to me ok. The learning algorithm comes back and says hey I want to know more about this part of the state space give me some samples from there right. I want to know more about this part of the input space give me. So, these are called active learning methods. So, so your question is valid point of this discussion is yeah one train one test is usually not a good idea right. So, what do you do? There are two things which you can do you can try to get multiple training sets from the data right. You can try to get multiple training sets from the data right and try to aggregate. 
no, no, nobody is asking me the obvious question, why are you getting multiple training sets from the data, why not one large training set? Yeah, but then why don't pull everything together and then create one large training set? Minimize the data I have received. The variation might be large. Yeah. Uh, close. Weak classifiers. Huh? Weak classifiers. Yeah. So I, I will have to spend a whole whole week on weak classifiers, right? So we'll come to that, right? So this is see that is one very very. Um, Amazing property that we'll uh, look at later, uh, which probably in the next class. I mean, later means pretty soon. Uh, uh, on uh, how you can take a lot of uh, uh, not so good classifiers, right? Uh, which are just better than random. Of course, it has to be better than random, right? It can't be worse than random. So classifiers that are just better than random, it give you an accuracy of 51 percent. Okay. So in the two class problem that is just better than random, okay. I can take classifiers that give you an accuracy of 51 percent and I can produce arbitrarily powerful classifiers, okay. It is an amazing, amazing insight uh, that came about a couple of uh, uh, a decade and a half ago, no maybe no, no I am old, yeah more than two decades ago. Right, and uh, it it it's it's it won the Godel Prize and things like that. It was it's an amazing, uh, amazingly uh, wonderful insight, uh, and we'll talk about that. Right, so that that completely revolutionized machine learning once. Right, people then uh, started saying that oh, I really didn't don't have to build this high, super optimized classifier. I can build a lot of this almost moronic classifiers, but the operational word is huh? almost. Right, uh, and I have a lot of them. Right, I have a lot of them, and I'll be able to do really well. In fact, uh, in many many uh, uh, applications that uh, we have worked on, right, in real life, uh, where I have worked on with uh, real data, uh, I incre I find it very hard to beat these kinds of classifiers. Right, you can think of whatever optimal classifier you want to come up with, right, but beating these kind of uh, groups of weak classifiers is actually very hard in practice. Right, so we'll talk about that. But no, that is not what I meant here. I still have a point I am trying to make, right. So, yeah, so even if you do one large training set, if you do one large one train one large test set, right. You can get away with it provided large is large enough, right. So provided large is something that is dense in your input space, right. If the large is so large that you essentially plaster your entire input space, right. So any point in the input space if I pick there will be one point very close by in the training set, that is what we mean by dense. I mean there is an actual more mathematical characterization of dense. Uh, but if, you have, if my training data is really dense in the, uh, in the in the input space, then it is fine, right? Then I can I can get away with just doing one one sample, right? One very large sample. But usually, what is going to happen is you are not going to get such a large sample. Right? So you're you're going to get a much smaller sample than that. And uh, therefore, if you just use one sample and try to make an estimate, okay? Then the variance. Do people remember what is the variance of the estimate? We talked about this again. No, 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 that is unstable. No, I am talking about variance. Yeah. Huh? Sorry? You train a lot of models on data of similar size. If I train a lot of models on data of similar size, the parameter estimation I am going to make will be varying a lot, right. So it turns out that instead of doing one sample and then trying to train this. Okay, if I take many many samples, right, and then find the parameters on these samples individually, right, and then take an average of those, right. turns out I can show that the variance will be lower in that case. So, what is the variance we are talking about? The variance in the parameter that we are estimating, okay. And what is the parameter we are talking about estimating here? Okay. 
So, here is the point where I am going to confuse all of you, uh, but the parameter I am talking about estimating here is the error, is the misclassification error, right. So, I have I have the classifier, right. What I am trying to measure is the misclassification error, right. That is what we are, the whole discussion was all about. I am trying to estimate the misclassification error, right. So, what I do is I start off with many samples of data, right, and on each sample I train a classifier separately, okay, and then I look at how the performance is on the test data and then take an average of all these performances and then I can tell you okay if you give me a new data new set of data I expect to make this much error on the test data right I am trying to figure out what the performance of the algorithm would be on a unseen train data right I see if I remember I was telling you I want to know how good my algorithm is right. So, this way I can estimate the performance of the algorithm on the unseen data, right. So, there are many ways in which you can generate this uh, there are many ways in which you can melt this uh, multiple uh, uh, training data sets, right. So, many of these are um, I mean have strong roots in statistics and were typically designed in, in eras where the amount of data available to you was small, right. And the amount of data available was small and we were trying to see how you can fake multiple data sets with a small amount of data, okay. So, the first technique is known as bootstrap, okay. So, bootstrap is actually a very powerful uh, statistical technique, it is used in a variety of different places, we will come back to another use of bootstrap a little later, uh, 